welcome to eCrit Care podcast. This is our episode number 120 and today I'm joined by my co-host Dr. Josh Chekho. Welcome Dr. Chekho. Thanks Swapnil. Good evening. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Today we are going to do a journal club and the study that we have chosen is recently published randomized controlled trial in New England Journal of Medicine uh, which kind of compared a very not commonly used intervention in a very specific setting and that is IV liver thyroxine in patients who are declared brain death for hemodynamic instability. Now the context for that study is the majority of the transplant hearts come from donors who are declared brain death. We do have a pathway for donation after circulatory death but again the use of hearts in that setting is quite limited. The majority of the cardiac transplant patients, they are usually receive their transplant, transplanted heart from the BD patients. Now, after the brain death, we all have seen and witnessed the hemodynamic instability that occurs quite commonly in patients. And then they often require vasopressor support in the form of either noradrenaline infusion or the vasopressin infusion. And the traditional protocols that are used with a lot of variability across the world is to add some steroids when they are hemodynamically instable or hemodynamically unstable and they are on very high dose of vasopressor support. But if they are not responding to steroids, the next line of treatment was always thought to be IV levothyroxine. And that was based after one large observational study which was published back in 2008 which showed benefit with regards to more transplanted hearts from the donors who had received the thyroid hormones. Now, there was no clinical robustness to that study. And in fact, there was not even measurement of thyroid hormone levels at the baseline to determine whether these patients do actually require IV T3 or not. After that observational trial, a lot of societies, intensive care societies or organ donation organizations adopted that as a part of the protocol. And in fact, in Australia, we also had that protocol where if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then we do consider IV T3 to optimize at least the chance of uh, successful transplantation. So I think this study has definitely challenged that dogma, and it's quite interesting read. Uh, so we're going to dive deeper into this study. So Dr. Chako, can you please walk us through the methodology and the results of this trial, please? Yeah, so the intravenous levothyroxine for unstable brain dead heart donors. It was conducted across fifteen organ procurement organizations in the U.S. and included brain dead patients with authorization for organ function. Eligible organ donors were randomized in a one-to-one -one ratio to receive levothyroxine or normal saline as placebo. The inclusion criteria were age between 14 to 55 years old in the donor, declaration of death according to neurologic criteria, body weight of 45 kilograms or more, and the presence of hemodynamic instability defined as a support with one or more vasopressors or inotropes after fluid resuscitation. The use of vasopressin for the management of diabetes insipidus was not considered to be part of circulatory support. The study excluded patients who had donor hearts that were not considered for transplantation due to pre-existing heart disease. Any treatment with thyroid hormone within the previous month was also an exclusion criteria. So they performed baseline three T4 levels before randomization, and the donors were randomly allocated to receive levothyroxine or saline, as I mentioned, in a one-to-one -one ratio within 24 hours of declaration of brain death. Randomization was stratified by site and in blocks of 30. So in the levothyroxine group, levothyroxine was administered as an infusion at 30 micrograms per hour and meant to be given for 12 hours. The dose could be decreased or discontinued based on pre-specified hemodynamic variables, including hypertension, tachycardia, or the presence of arrhythmias. Levothyroxine infusion could be prolonged beyond 12 hours at the discretion of each organ procurement organization. Open-label use of levothyroxine was discouraged. However, it was permitted in the control group after 12 hours of saline infusion. 
and the control group, as I mentioned, received a similar volume of 30 mils per hour of normal saline. How did they calculate the sample size? The authors hypothesized that liver thyroxine administration would result in an increase in the number of hearts transplanted by 10 percentage points. A sample size of 800 donors provided the trial with a minimum of 80% power to detect this effect of treatment from a baseline of 35%, that is an increase in the number of hearts transplanted. Transplant of 320 hearts provided 78% power to assess non-inferiority of graft outcome at a one-sided alpha of 0.025. So that was non-inferiority. So there were two outcomes. First is the number of hearts transplanted. And second was to assess the non-inferiority of graft outcome at one month. So what did the investigators find? They screened more than 3,000 donors. 852 were enrolled and underwent randomization. The mean donor age was 36 years, and they were predominantly men. The median time from declaration of brain death to commencement of the study infusion was 8.6 hours in the liver thyroxine group and 7.5 hours in the saline group. Base suppressor and inotropic support were similar in both groups at baseline. So were the baseline three T4 levels, which is one nanograms per deciliter, the median level in both the groups. The dose of liver thyroxine was weaned down in 11% of patients and discontinued in 14% before the stipulated time frame of 12 hours. The median three T4 level at organ recovery was higher with liver thyroxine, obviously. It was 1.4 nanograms per deciliter compared to one nanogram per deciliter in the saline group. Half the donors in the liver thyroxine group received the infusion beyond the pre-specified 12-hour period. In the saline group, 12% of donors received open-label liver thyroxine after the 12-hour period of saline infusion. So what about the outcomes? As I mentioned, the primary outcome, there were two primary outcomes. First was the rate of hearts transplanted. This was 54.9% in the levothyroxine group and 53.2% in the saline group. So there was no difference between the number of hearts transplanted with levothyroxine versus placebo. The difference was not statistically significant. And they also did not find any difference in graft survival, survival of the heart the transplanted heart at 30 days. It was 97.4% with levothyroxine and 95.5% with saline placebo. So graft survival at 30 days was also similar, establishing non-inferiority of not using levothyroxine. They looked at predefined subgroups of patients, and the rates of hearts transplanted in predefined subgroups based on the duration of time the declaration of brain death to the commencement of infusion of less than 12 hours or more than 12 hours, or based on the ejection fraction, less than 50% or more than 50%. These subgroups did not show any difference in the number of hearts transplanted. They also performed post hoc analysis, which did not reveal any difference in treatment effect in terms of vasopressor use, in terms of the dose of vasopressors based on the randomization into one or the other arms. What were the secondary outcomes? As I mentioned, there was no difference in the between groups in the median number of organs transplanted, which was four in both groups with an interquartile range of three to five. The number of lungs, liver, and kidneys that were transplanted were also similar in, the, in both the groups. As I mentioned, the dose of vasopressors and the rate at which they were weaned down were similar regardless of whether they received levothyroxine or placebo. They looked at adverse events as well. Serious adverse events were few and similar in both groups. It was just 0.5% versus 0.7%. Severe hypertension and tachycardia 
was more common with liver thyroxine compared to saline. So if anything, it showed that liver thyroxine may be associated with more adverse events. So the authors concluded that the study did not demonstrate a benefit of treatment with intravenous liver thyroxine in the number of hearts transplanted or the donor cardiac function at 30 days. Hemodynamic stability was similar in both groups, and the study suggests a lack of physiological effect of liver thyroxine on the donor cardiovascular function. Liver thyroxine did not impact hemodynamic stability in the donor, besides transformation rates were also similar. Thanks, Dr. Chako. So, first of all, this is an amazing study uh, because this is the first largest randomized controlled trial on this topic. Now, maybe we should look at the limitations first and maybe come back to the, some of the strengths of this trial. So first and foremost, limitation is the open-label trial, and there was some crossover with the use of levothyroxine even in the control group, where the, the use of levothyroxine was permitted to use after 12 hours. And also, baseline, the T4 levels, where they were not obviously low, and then if the patient is not hyperthyroid, why do we use thyroxine? Having said that, that has been the practice across the world at the moment because we at least give empirical IV T3 when the patient is profoundly hypotensive and on significant doses of vasopressor therapy. It sounds like a very pragmatic study and they really wanted to challenge this dogma at the moment which is happening across the world where it's almost like a staged therapy where if the patient is on high dose of vasopressor therapy, in order to avoid failure of transplantation, of clinicians decide to choose to give hormonal replacement therapy. And part of the hormonal replacement therapy is steroid and thyroxine. So there is no conclusive evidence in the past. And that's why the practice has become quite common in a lot of parts of the world. And so I think this is a very timely study. We challenge the dogma and has given us a very kind of clear answer with regards to use of and I think that they did quite a number of uh, good things. So first of all, at the baseline, there is no difference between the two groups, which is always a good thing with regards to internal validity. A lot of the patients recruited in this study were quite young. So the average age was like 36 of the brain dead donors, which might have sometimes question if you choose towards the elderly age group. And usually the heart transplant cutoff is probably 55. And again, it will vary depending on each, which, which country and jurisdiction you practice in. If we have a slightly older patient, whether that will change, not sure. And also they did a bedside echo and try to calculate, look at the ejection fraction and see whether that will impair. And that can be sometimes controversial because the estimation of ejection fraction is very subjective phenomena and myocardial dysfunction might not be apparent. And obviously we all know that ejection fraction is a very crude major or the marker of cardiac function, but they tried to standardize in order to compare the benefit of levothyroxine in this subgroup of patients. So primary outcome that they chose quite smart because most of the transplant centers nowadays request that the donor should get IVT3 in order to stabilize and also reduce the requirement of adrenaline or noradrenaline in order to preserve the graft function. So most of the time, these kind of requests come from the transplant centers. Having said that, in this study, transplant teams didn't have much say in terms of whether the patient will get T3 or not. So this study probably gave us a very conclusive evidence in this topic and probably will change the practices across the world. The fourth good thing about this study is, is the, the cost effectiveness. I think the T3, IVT3 is not a cheap intervention and it's not readily available even in some of the remote part of the Australia here. So I guess in order to get this intervention accessible can be quite challenging. So obviously not giving T3 routinely in a patient who is on order of 10 or 20 mils per hour will probably save a lot of costs as well. So that's the kind of my initial thoughts. What's your thoughts, Dr. Jekyll? Well, uh, to begin with, it's uh, very hard to get intravenous levothyroxine in India. So we don't do this as a routine practice. And I strongly feel that this study clearly shows that empirical therapy with levothyroxine is not appropriate. It might even cause harm, as we saw in this study, hypertension, arrhythmias. These were all more common in patients who received levothyroxine. But the question, of course, as you rightly mentioned, is that in this particular study, most of the donors were not hypothyroid. 
it's certainly not profoundly hypothyroid, which may have masked any kind of potential benefit. They did subgroup analysis in patients with low three T4 levels, but, but the size of this particular group was too small to come to any conclusions. So I suppose as empirical therapy, one would not use replacement with levothyroxine in brain dead donors. However, unstable, they may be hemodynamically based on the findings of this study. Thanks, Dr. Seko. And I guess the tale of the levothyroxine in donor patients is, is to me, it's like the tale of inhaled nitric oxide in patients with ARDS. We know from the evidence there's no major benefit with regards to use of inhaled nitric oxide on mortality of the patients. It does not really change much. However, it's still used as a rescue therapy in many centers because if you can't put the patient on ECMO or if there is a contraindication for ECMO, if you can't really get and do anything, what, what's the kind of last resort therapy? So people use inhaled nitric oxide or uh, prostaglandin infusions as a last rescue measure in some centers. And I think that's probably what this study will reduce the role of levothyroxine in this cohort of patients, where you're really struggling to reduce the doses of vasopressors and you really are not winning at all. And obviously you need to stabilize the patient in order to get to organ donation, I think it might be tried as a last ditch effort. But again, that kind of context is very, very limited. And I think this study has clearly gave us a signal that routine use of levothyroxine in patients who are declared brain dead is not indicated at all. So that's the kind of key take home message, and it will definitely change the practices across the world. So that's the end of our today's podcast. We'll be back in fortnight's time with another episode. Till then, goodbye and have a nice time. Thanks, Sopal. Thanks, everyone, for listening in. Till next time. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to eCrit Care Podcast. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass along our web address, www.critcareedu.com.au to your friends and colleagues. And please leave us a positive review on iTunes. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. Check us out on Facebook at Critical Care Education. Join us next time for another edition of eCrit Care Podcast.